Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to April's First Friday webinar. My name's Ariana. I'm the Education Specialist with ISB. And as always, I'll be your moderator today. Our topic this month is Designing in the Floodplain with Wet and Dry Floodproofing Options. And our speaker is Tom Little. He is a certified floodplain manager and licensed insurance broker, who currently serves as a vice president at SmartVent Products, Inc. So thank you for being with us today, Tom. Absolutely. I just have a few quick announcements. Before we get started, um, the handouts in the quiz can be found on our usual web page, but there's also a link you can follow um, from your confirmation email. And you can download the handouts on the handout section of your toolbar, and you can find the quiz link in the chat box as well. If you have a question for Tom at any time during the presentation, you can type it in the questions box, and we will answer those at the end. Um, I think that's all I have, so I'll hand things over to Tom. Hey, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Um, so, uh, as Ariana uh, explained, we're going to talk about floodplain design constructions, uh, construction codes as they pertain to the floodplain. Um, but our main focus is going to be on wet and dry flood proofing systems, um, dry flood proofing barriers, wet flood proofing. We're going to really focus in on flood venting. Um, and then we're also going to talk about the impacts on flood insurance kind of as we go, because with the NFIP, FEMA regulations, the flood proofing system and techniques that you utilize, if done properly, will lower the risk on the property, whether it's a residential structure or, or commercial building. And when you lower the risk, you lower the premium. So one kind of feeds the other. So we'll bridge that gap a bit. Um, that's me on the screen right there. Um, as I was introduced, right, Tom Little, CFM stands for Certified Floodplain Manager. Um, uh, the companies that we're associated with, you'll see a couple of those brands, smartvent.com, that's our line of flood vents, and then also floodproofing.com. My cell phone number is there along with my email. So feel free to jot that down. And if um, you, you want to keep that on file, if you ever have a question now or in the future as it pertains to floodplain construction, impacts on flood insurance, you know, should I use wet flood proofing here or dry flood proofing, the do's and the don'ts, whatever it might be as it pertains to flooding, feel free to reach out at any time. Um, we're very happy to help. Um, before we get into the nuts and bolts, just a little background about who we are as a business. Um, you see floodproofing.com and SmartVent. Um, we got our start in the flood proofing industry with um, the wet flood proofing category, flood vents. And our brand is called SmartVent. Um, that brand's been out on the market for 20 years now. We have over 750,000 of those vents in the field, and we're protecting over 150 million square foot of enclosed area in the floodplain. Really proud of that number. The vents made in the United States. It's made in Anderson, South Carolina. Um, it's constructed out of 316 marine grade stainless steel. Um, and that's where we got our start. But over the years, we've developed into really being a, a technical resource, a technical um, uh, you know, group that can help support you with your design needs when you're working in those FEMA map flood areas. So we're certified floodplain manager. We do have that uh, insurance agency background. We have an insurance agency in-house that specializes in flood insurance. And we have engineers on staff that actually will assist, and you'll see a call out, send plans to plans at floodproofing.com. And when you do that, we give you a project number and we'll help you with a flood vent layout. We'll help you with dry flood proofing systems and give you a product matrix. And then we can also help you with uh, flood zone determinations. So all of our engineering staff assist with that complimentary review. So plans at floodproofing.com is a, a good email to document. But over the years, we've been through the Katrinas, the Sandys, the Harveys, the Irmas, all the significant floods. Gosh, this is pretty timely, right, with the, the Midwest floods right now. Um, and so there's a lot of case studies that are popping up. One we just had in Davenport, Iowa, um, where there was a, uh, a property um, uh, that had our flood vent system. And, and it's, it's going viral on the Internet right now, Facebook and everything, because the vents are being shown um, working during the flood and, it's, and the building's flooding, but it's, it's structurally sound. So a lot of what we're going to focus on today is, is being structurally sound with our designs in the floodplain. Uh, we'll talk through dry flood proofing, active and passive barriers and shields. We sell all those products through floodproofing.com and the installation side of things we also handle. So we are a turnkey service. Everything from the products, 
and the engineering know-how to installing these devices properly in the field. Um, so I know you're going to get one PDH uh, uh, credit for today, but we also have AIA approval. So if you happen to be an AIA member, you could send us your AIA member number. We could also get you an AIA credit. If there's any CFMs on the phone, you can also get a one hour credit for this course as well. Um, learning objectives kind of touched on these already, but let's go through floodplains, the potential hazards on buildings. Let's go through the differences of wet and dry flood proofing techniques, the difference between passive and active approaches, and we'll tie it all back to where you can find this information into the codes and the regulations. And then we'll pull in the flood insurance side of things and, and explain how mitigation solutions can translate into a lower premium. This is an actual image in the background of uh, Hurricane Harvey, uh, the effects of Hurricane Harvey in the Houston area. You know, one of the key takes, takeaways in this photo is this is actually in a, it's outside the special flood hazard area. And the special flood hazard area uh, um, is made up of two types of flood zones, an A zone and a V zone. So in this, this image right here, this is actually a shaded X zone area that flooded during Harvey. All right, so shaded X zone means that it's outside the special flood hazard area. It's mapped as a floodplain, but in a low risk area. And what we've learned, especially when we look at Houston, is Mother Nature does not listen to the map. So although we're looking at, all right, we got to follow the rules and regulations when I'm in a special flood hazard area. If a property on one side of the street's in an A zone and across the street is the X zone, it's not like, woohoo, we don't have to, you know, meet the building codes and the FEMA regulations. Let's maybe think through. I might have to prepare uh, right now for what's coming down the road or in the future because Mother Nature doesn't listen to those lines. Case in point, Harvey. So um, a couple of the terms to be familiar with as we are designing in a flood zone, base flood elevation, BFE. It's the calculated level that flow waters will rise during a base flood event. We call this the 1% annual chance flood. We used to call it the 100 year storm, but then we're getting away from the 100 year storm in the industry because people actually think, hey, it, it, it's flooded here in New Jersey six years ago. I'm good for 94 more years, right? It's not the case. So, you know, get into the habit of calling it the base flood event. It's the 1% annual chance flood event. Now you're gonna find the base flood elevation that's going to be documented on the firm map, the flood insurance rate map. OK, so you'll find that one percent annual chance flood level on a firm map um, uh, for design purposes. Now, the two zones, I kind of hit on those already. A zones are your areas that are going to be. And if I'm looking at this map over on the left hand side in yellow, this is off. Now, in your case, most of you all are, are, are in that Midwest area. This is more of a coastal map. But A zones are, are dealing with, you know, uh, maybe some velocity of flood water, but typically the water is just kind of surrounding a building, surrounding a home. Um, v zones, think of velocity. This is where you're going to have storm induced waves, and typically they're right along the coastline. But in most of the applications you're going to be working on, you're going to be working on A zone type areas where we're really dealing with um, hydrostatic forces and occasionally hydrodynamic forces. Freeboard is when we go above and beyond the base flood elevation. And a lot of the communities you, you'll work in will have a free board requirement. That means that the BFEs that say uh, seven feet and the community's enforcing a two foot free board requirement, you're gonna take your seven foot plus the two foot of free board, uh, free board and your design flood elevation is gonna be nine feet, all right? Now that free board is critical. As I talked about mother nature not working with the maps, when you go above and beyond, that builds in a safety factor when it comes to elevation. So if the water rises up above the base flood elevation and mother nature doesn't go, oh, I'm at the BFE, I gotta turn it off. You know, I'll turn the flood water off. No, it could go up to that another foot or another two. Now you have that, bu uh, that buffer in there. Here's what a floodplain map looks like. Um, you know, what's, what's unique about this map that always gets me is in this blue shaded area, this is a VE zone, all right? It's a velocity zone. Um, and then right on the other side, they have this area just mapped as an X zone. And, and, it's, and this happens to be oceanfront. You'll see this with riverine areas too. And it's like, well, how does mother nature know that where that little orange pin is, oh, I'm not supposed to go any further from that line. You know, that, that house needs to stay in the X zone. And, and, and case of point Houston, 
that's not always the case. So you're going to see maps are constantly being updated now with um, a strong push to modernize those. Um, but just know you want to get the latest and greatest data when it comes to the maps. You can go to the FEMA Flood Map Service Center. Um, you can work with flood insurance companies. I, I, I told you already, that's something that we also help out in the design community with. Come to us. We're happy to also give you a zone determination. Um, if you're working on a larger project, that's when your hydrology firms will, will get involved. Um, so the key thing is get the most up-to-date information as it pertains to... Um, there are three basic... Now, this particular zones. video, as I'm running in the background, let me turn the volume down on this. It's just kind of explaining in this animation the different types of flood zones. And so you'll see typically right along any shoreline, that's where your VE zones are going to be. That's where the velocity is going to be. And then beyond that mark, you'll find the A zones. And then there's a zone X in the back. That's our low risk areas, but can still flood as we know. Now they've added a coastal A zone, um, which falls within the, and you'll see it pop up, the limit of moderate wave action or LIMWA. And that's really that buffer between the um, uh, LIMWA line and the VE zone where coastal A zones, you're actually, they're regulating them as if they are VE zones. Again, something that maybe you don't have to typically deal with in your uh, markets, but um, just a helpful animation to kind of explain the different types of zones and risks there. But as we look at what we're, we need to do to design a resilient structure in these areas, we're dealing with hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure exerting forces on the left and the right of the building. We have to deal with buoyancy forces. When we have a subgrade um, enclosure, um, in the in the floodplain, we have even greater buoyancy forces. We might have additional saturated soil pressures exerting force up against the wall. In new construction and residential applications, you can't have a basement in the floodplain. It cannot be subgrade, and you got to be careful there. Sometimes you might have a crawl space floor that's sitting below grade on all four sides, and FEMA looks at that, that as a basement in the floodplain and dings the property owner with a higher flood insurance premium. So you won't see a you know, a setup like this over on the right-hand side in a um, new construction application residential, but you might with a commercial building and you might dry flood proof that, but you're going to have to deal with these greater soil pressures, worry about buoyancy forces and so forth. Um, the effects of pressure, I think we've all seen devastation, uh, the pictures of devastation, Hurricane Michael in Mexico Beach, um, Hurricane Sandy, you know, this is the force of flood water, whether it's hydrostatic or hydrodynamic. Um, it's it, it packs a punch, right? It's going to come in um, very powerful and can wipe a building, a house right up off its foundation. Um, here's the effects of some hydrostatic forces, close up images. These are all actually riverine situations. Um, in picture A, the force of the flood water built up on the outside of the foundation and caused the wall to collapse because there was no adequate flood vents in that particular foundation. Um, picture B, what you're seeing here is uh, a great example of why flood vents need to be bidirectional. Let the water in and let the water out. Look at where those blocks are. They're all on the outside of the foundation. So water got in quick enough to relieve pressure, but it couldn't get out quick enough to, um, to exit. So again, flood vents need to be bidirectional and they need to be passive, um, uh, automatic, automatic entry and exit of floodwaters without human intervention, right? So all, all wet flood proofing systems need to be passive. In D, you can see debris effect of flood. Flood water is always gonna carry stuff in it. Debris, uh, you know, grass, leaves, pine needles, whatever, mulch, all can clog up air vents. That's why they don't make for a good flood vent. In this picture, the air vent clogged with debris. And what happened is that debris and that water started to push its way through the mortar joint and compromise the entire foundation. Uh, picture C speaks for itself, buoyancy forces. Um, it, here's, here's a couple of shots. This was a concrete home in uh, the Keys in Florida, um, to, you know, totally reinforced concrete and the water just bashed its way through. So when we're talking residential applications, we're talking wet flood proofing, which requires um, elevation, right? So with residential construction in the flood zone, we're going to elevate our first living floor above the base flood elevation. And we're also going to raise our mechanicals, 
our air handler is going to be above the BFE. Maybe we're hanging it from the ceiling. We're going to put our AC units on platforms. We're going to have, as you see over on the left, proper flood vents. And we show a couple images of some commercial applications. You can wet flood proof a commercial building. In some cases, it's the most desirable because these are going to be passive approaches where the water just automatically enters and exits the building, relieves the hydrostatic load, and you're going to have all of your finishes up above the BFA. Um, so as we're talking about wet flood proofing systems, let's talk about the different types of enclosures that you're going to be installing flood vents, worrying about raising your mechanicals, using flood resistant materials. And the NFIP flood insurance manual defines an enclosure. Again, everything ties back to, to the flood insurance world. Enclosure is any portion of an elevated building that has um, a raised floor, and then below that raised floor, it's shut in by rigid walls. And that could be, you know, a, a 25 by 25 foot space that's enclosed all the way down to a five by five enclosed space that you're using just as a little foyer to get to the next higher floor. If it's enclosed below the BFE, it's going to require flood openings. Now, the most popular ones, crawl spaces, full height enclosures and garages, commercial garages, class one type of structures, as you'd find in ASCE 24. 14, class one structures, agricultural type buildings, pole barns, in this particular case, a firehouse, right? And, and, and we have wet flood proofing going through where they keep the um, apparatus in, uh, you know, from a parking standpoint. So just some examples. I think we kind of, you know, you're all designers, right? Um, engineers, that is. Flood vents are relieving pressure, right? So we're allowing the water to flow in and flow out to keep that 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 sh that supporting wall structurally sound during a flood. So on the left hand side, what we see here is inadequate flood bending. Right, we have a buildup of head pressure on the outside of the wall. Now that can cause that wall to collapse. All right. So so the the pass fail mark for any flood vents is it's got to equalize pressure at any time during a test that we run. You can have a differential of head pressure of more than one foot on either side of the um, foundation wall. And that's also the requirement for placement. The bottom of the vent needs to be within one foot of the highest adjacent grade. And that's because it's proven out that one foot of head pressure is enough to cause structural damage. So what we wanna see is what's on the right, equalization on either side. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is, even if that wall is not gonna fail, you might be losing flood storage capacity that's very important in a riverine setting, which can grow the floodplain outward and graze the depths of the flood water um, and maybe flood somebody or flood a building that normally wouldn't be affected because we lost the storage capacity of a footprint of a building. And that happens, you know, we call that no adverse impact. We have a slide on that, but that's just another consideration, especially when you're de dealing with riverine situations. Ocean floods, you know, you kind of have endless amount of area that, that the water goes, riverine, it can be very condensed and, and every uh, ounce of storage is, is crucial, right? And we saw that in, in, uh, in Houston, all over the place, right? So flood opening options, two types really, non-engineered openings on the left, and then we have ICCES certified engineered openings on the right. So on the left, you're probably looking at it and you're going, well, Tom, that looks just like an air vent. And that's exactly what it is. Non-engineered openings are air vents. And, and, and engineered openings are devices that mechanically operate. They flip open and there's no screen, there's no louver or grill to impede the flow. So an air vent will clog with debris during a flood and, and a certified engineered opening will not because it's been designed and tested to allow for certain amount of debris flow per the specification. So we're gonna cover those two types, but some of the key characteristics for all flood vents all right, is that they're going to be required in all enclosed areas below the base flood elevation or the design flood elevation. Um, and their objective is to relieve pressure. So we're not resisting like we would with dry flood proofing. We're relieving pressure off of the foundation walls. You're going to have them on at least two different walls. And we'll go through the placement requirements here in a bit. But they all need to be passive. They need to equalize that hydrostatic pressure automatically without human intervention. So a garage door doesn't qualify, a window doesn't qualify. You can't put a cover over a flood opening and go, you know what, I'll run out there and go and remove that prior to this uh, to this flood event. 
it's got to automatically operate totally without human intervention. So we're talking passive solutions only. It's got to work in both directions. It's got to be bidirectional, let the water in and out the other end and vice versa. So regardless of the direction of flow of water, the vent needs to work and perform in both directions. Um, flood vents are part of a technique called wet flood proofing because you're going to elevate your first floor up above the base flood elevation plus any freeboard. You're going to then make sure everything below that is flood resistant materials, um, pressure treated lumber. Um, in our case, we use stainless steel. It's That area is designed to flood. Stuff is going to get wet. All right, so that's got to be part of your design consideration. But that's why we call it wet flood proofing. We're letting that water in. Now, the options, again, non-engineered openings. Now, I like to break this down. Non-engineered, let's break that down. Non means not. And when we're all engineers here, right? So when you engineer something, we design something. So these air vents are not designed as flood openings. That's what non-engineered openings mean. And, and if you call up any air vent company out there and say, hey, how many of these vents do I need to use as a flood vent? Uh, to meet the flood vent requirements, they're going to go, what's a flood vent? All right. They don't even know that these devices in the past have been used as flood vents. All right. They've designed them as air ventilation. A lot of them come with mechanisms that can be closed off during the colder months. But when you have a closed air vent in a foundation, that's not going to relieve any pressure off the wall. All right. Let alone even if they're in the broken, op broken in the open position, they're going to clog with debris, which is another big issue with the air vents. But um, when you look at the calculations for a non-engineered opening, you're using one square inch of net open area for every one square foot of enclosed area. So if I have a thousand square foot crawl space, I need a thousand square uh, inches of net open area to meet the flood venting requirements. Devices like I'm picturing here, they need to be broken in the open position. Now, I don't know if there's any other product that you maybe call out on a set of plans that you actually have to write in there make sure it's broken for it to comply. So the fact that you have to make sure it's broken tells you it's it's not the right product for the job. Now I get the question all the time, well, why do they even give you that option? Why does FEMA give you that option? In 1986, when they came out to, with the rules for flood vents, the only option out there at that time were air vents. And so they kind of been grandfathered in, but FEMA has been with their language and endorsing the building codes and ASE standards. They've been weaning people off of them. And I'll explain some of that language where it talks about debris impact and the issues with people closing them off. Um, but the one key thing to do, and we see this every day, these vents are being misrated. People will go 16 inches by eight inches. That's 128 square inches all day. Uh, wrong. We got to measure the net free area in between these slots. You have to account for those obstructions to flow. And when the when we talk about liability, it doesn't rest on an air vent company. They do not have liability insurance for that device being used as a flood vent. So you just got to keep that in mind. What they designed it for was not for flood venting purposes. Now, uh, from a calculation standpoint, in case you're curious where the one square inch for every one square foot requirement comes from. It comes from ASCE 24. Um, FEMA references this and also the building code references this. But um, when you're figuring out the flow rate through any orifice, we're using a coefficient of discharge, uh, obstructed openings such as air vents, and they define that an obstruction as being anything that has louvers, blades, screens, grills, or face plates that are going to impede the, the floodwaters from coming in and out or could necessarily clog with debris, right? So then you use 0.20 in the actual calculation, and it yields that you need 80, 0.83 square inches for every one square foot of enclosed space from a flow standpoint. And then what they did is they rounded that up. They rounded 0.83 up to one. So it's one square inch for every one square foot. But you'll find that in ASCE 24. Now, we're going to get to this in a minute, but you'll see Partially obstructed air vents, right, because they're always going to have at minimum a screen on them, are using 0.20. And then you look at a um, unobstructed opening that's rectangular, and you're using a 0.40. So you're increasing the coefficient of discharge, the amount of flow that you're going to get through that opening. Um, and that's really when you start to see how an engineered opening that's 16 by 8 covers 200 square feet of enclosed area, where an air vent you bust it in the open position, it's only going to cover 42 square inches. This will clog with debris. This will allow debris to flow through because all this area is unobstructed. You'd be able to stick your hand right through once it's activated during a flood. So if we run some quick math and we look at a house that's 1,200 square foot, 
and we're using a non-engineered opening like we've seen this picture. It's busted in the open position. 1,200 divided by 42, you need 29 total vents around the perimeter of this foundation. If you were using an engineered vent, one that's certified to cover 200 square feet in the 1,200, you're only going to have six. So we're taking it from 29 vents down to six vents. So a dramatic difference. And then, and then FEMA has actually come out with a document, FEMA Technical Bulletin 1. I can email this out to everyone, no problem. Um, it's kind of the one-stop shop for all the wet flood proofing requirements. But on page 19 of Technical Bulletin 1, they list through. This is an example of how FEMA is strengthening their regulations and encouraging people not to use air vents. They state all the different unacceptable measures. Temperature controlled vents. These are unacceptable. They would be a zero rated flood vent because the louver slams shut with flood water. If it comes with a cover or it appears a cover can be placed over it, it's going to be a zero rating. Here, this vent comes with a cover. Um, garage doors, I mentioned that in the beginning. Garage doors don't qualify as flood vents because they're not passive, right? Remember, you can't have any human intervention involved with activating your flood vents, right? So in, in FEMA's documentation, you'll find unacceptable measures. And here, here's the big kicker. Here is why engineered flood vents are so critical. You've got to allow that debris to pass through. Remember that temperature controlled vent? Here it is. So what we're showing is this vent right here in this top picture. And then we're looking at it here and it's clogged. This was after Hurricane Matthews in, in the Carolinas a couple years ago. The louver slammed shut. But even if those louvers weren't, weren't in there, the screen, the grill clogged up with debris. That's what was in the flood water and it stuck to that screen and prevented any flood water from uh, passing through the foundation wall. Um, so you're going to have stuff in flood water. A couple more shots here you know, of air vents clogging with debris uh, after a flood is obviously when these were taken. And ASC 24 has come out with really strong language. And again, FEMA points to ASC 24. It's the holy grail of design standards uh, for floodplain construction. But it says any louvers, blades, screens, and face plates um, should be selected or specified so as to minimize the likelihood of blockage of small debris and sediment. So choose something that doesn't have a screen on it. And then they go on further to say, where you've experience has shown that those type of devices have been blocked or clogged by flood debris, avoid using those such, uh, pardon me, use of those uh, such devices should be avoided, right? So what we've known through our history is air vents clog with debris. The picture in this uh, uh, middle right here that I'm uh, kind of moving my cursor over, I took this picture in Houston in an area called Meyerland, and it had these 16 by 8 holes all around the foundation, and it had this screening kind of, you know, worked into the concrete form of the opening, and they were all clogged with debris. And we saw this in the Houston area. Houston has since updated their ordinance, and they will no longer accept flood openings, uh, even though FEMA says, oh, you can use them, but use the net free area and break them in the open position. Houston said, uh-uh, we want to make sure that we comply to these standards. We've seen these things clog, and, and therefore, um, they list them as unacceptable. So it's important to have that debris flow. And so the category of vents that, you know, we, we strongly encourage is, is engineered vents. It's specifically designed for allowing flow water to flow through, relieve the hydrostatic pressure. They automatically operate, so they go from being in the lock position to being unobstructed. So here you can see... Um, in this particular case, this flood vent is going to be open. Now, they're designed, tested, but then most importantly, certified for performance. And so you just don't run the math, right? You got to run the math, but then there's actual acceptance criteria through the International Co-Council Evaluation Service. AC364 stands for acceptance criteria 364, mechanically operated flood vents. That's what MOFV stands for. So the vent it's going to go from being closed and and what i would say as being it's an it's obstructed opening at this point because you don't want rodents and raccoons and anything working its way into the uh, crawl space or the you know garage enclosure and then what happens is there's a, there's two floats on either side of the uh vent door and where i'm kind of hovering my cursor over there's a float in there where that slot is now flood water fills the slot and it activates the floats to lift unlatch the flood door and pivot open and now there's completely no obstruction to flow flood water can pass right through and specifically a three inch diameter sphere now that's in the actual um testing of the vent 
to account for debris flow. And so we'll run a quick little video right now of the actual testing, and you'll see the three inch balls in the test tank, a bunch of different sea grass and leaves. This is all part of the ICC testing, and as water rises up, it fills those slots, and boom, you can see the flood door kick open. Now, the vent previously I showed was, in, was a dual function vent, so it provided airflow and the flood protection element. This is an insulated flood door, so you use this in like a full height enclosure, a commercial application. It's got a two inch styrofoam core on the inside of this and a weather gasket, so it provides no airflow, but gives you the flood venting relief that you need during a flood event. So again, the water rises up, fills the slots, floats lift. You'll see it eat this can like in a minute, like burps it through, like blah, blah, goes through. And you can see the water equalizing on either side of this foundation wall. That's what we want to see. Now, the minimum rate of rise and fall that you have to test to is five feet per hour. In our tank right here, we're actually working off of a 25 foot rate of rise per hour, which is, you know, five times the minimum and we pumped our hydrant up as quick as we could and we couldn't get more than a quarter inch differential between our two test chambers so it's extremely efficient for relieving that pressure and and you get no cloggage with debris because the debris passes right through all right so one of the other cool things as i advance here is um there are accessory kits that are out on the market that will help you to seal off that opening even more um, we've seen over the years with flood vents, um, property owners, whether it be homeowners or a commercial building owner, you know, they think they got to, you know, stuff insulation or put a board behind the vent opening, whatever type of vent they're using to, to, to seal it up, especially during those colder months. Well, when you can't cover over a, a flood vent, period, no matter what type it is, um, but there now are ICC evaluated accessories. This is a sealing kit. And, um, it's constructed out of homosote. homosote has been around for hundreds of years. It's a 98% recycled material. And there's 21 of these blocks that actually, now this gets installed on the interior and it would work in conjunction with an insulated vent on the exterior, but now it finishes off the inside and it seals it up. It you know crushes a blow door test, meets the 2018 energy codes. So now that opening is completely sealed up, but God forbid there is a flood, the vent will activate and the blocks within the ceiling kit will bust out like you see in this video here to allow that water to flow freely out. Um, and there you go, you can see it doing its job. It's just saw a couple leaves pop through. All right, now debris is critical, right? We need to allow debris to flow through. This particular project, and this is perfect, you're, you're, you're all from the Illinois area. This property that I'm showing right here is from Peoria, Illinois. It's right on um, the Illinois River. And uh, this is the Wagner's house. And that's a case study I can send out to you in a link afterwards that I think you'll find very, very um, relevant. This particular property was elevated in 1992. They put no flood vents in the enclosed area. The homeowner was paying um, close to $3,000 a year for flood insurance. So we retrofitted it in with compliant flood vents. And literally 10 months later, the place floods. So they put the vents in to reduce the premium and then it floods 10 months later. This is an actual shot from that flood. So when we're talking debris, this is what you really see in a true flood situation. All this debris in the flood water, the vents are activated, water's flowing back out. And after the water receded, the house is still standing. No structural damage whatsoever. They had six feet of water in that enclosed space for six weeks straight as the Illinois River flooded. And, and, and here's how it influences flood insurance rates. So when you don't have compliant flood vents below the base flood elevation, from a rating standpoint, we're rating nine feet below the base flood elevation. We're, this is a negative nine rated structure and the actuarial premium was going up eventually to $9,000. They were only in the, you know, the two range, but they were eventually, they were seeing these annual increases. They were being phased out of subsidized rates and in the next five years, they were going to hit $9,000 in flood insurance premium. All right. So what we needed to do was come in and retrofit them in with compliant flood vents. It only took five flood vents. Um, it, the retrofit cost them uh, $1,200. And the premium went from, well, there you go, $2,000 down to $511. It was a 75% reduction. And the refund total 
as you can see, this is Mr. and Mrs. Wagner. This guy was awesome. 28 year veteran of the Air Force. Mrs. Wagner, she was a little iffy. She's like, are you sure these vents are going to reduce our flood insurance premium? And I said, Mrs. Wagner, they sure as heck are. She puts the vents in and I said, you know, I explained reducing risk. Now your foundation's protected. You get flooded. We know there's not going to be structural damage due to hydrostatic load, right? She got a refund check, three of them, and it totaled $3,200 minus the retrofit of $1,200. She had $2,000 left over for vacation. Mrs. Wagner was a happy customer. But that's the power of flood, vent, flood vents, especially as it pertains to residential applications. So when we reduce the likelihood of structural damage, you get a lower premium through the NFIP. We saw it in Houston, elevated homes right here on the left. Elevated, properly vented, no damage. Slab on grade, you saw miles of this. Debris piles as tall as the house, right? Then there were stories of, like we saw here, an elevated structure. This is a ICC certified flood vent. Uh, covers 400 square foot because there's uh, it's a 16 by 16. These happen to be powder coat painted black, so aesthetically they blend in. Um, but this particular house, homeowners next door, and you can see right in this picture, called the architect who was the design build guy, right? And they said, David, we are flooding. We got four foot of water in our house. We can't evacuate now. What's the key code to get into the house across the street? And he gave it to them and they put their kids on pool floats, floated them over to this elevated home. And they took refuge in it for two full days because their house was being flooded out. Now they should have evacuated. We all know that, but that's the power of elevation. The flood vents did their job to relieve pressure homeowners safe and sound in that property um so when we talk about performance testing it's you got to performance tested but then there's cases where mother nature is going to you know prove the product's worth and time and time again icc certified flood vents step up to the plate and save a foundation save people money on flood insurance because you're doing it right so it's mother nature proven like we saw in the wagners and in houston and and as part of the testing you're going to get a report so when you're selecting flood vents to specify on plans, look for an ICC evaluated product. Look for something that's constructed out of flood resistant materials like 316 stainless steel. Each vent is going to come with a identify, uh, identification label. You know, this one covers 200 square feet. Um, happens to be made in USA. That's cool. Each vent is tested. Now, in our particular case, when they come off the production line, we put them in a test tank, run water through them to make sure they're going to perform. And then the ICC, because they're nice people, they do spot inspections of our manufacturing plant. Um, so, so those are the two different types of, of vents. Remember, all flood vents need to be passive. They need to automatically work, and you got to allow uh, debris to pass through. Um, building diagrams are associated with elevating buildings. We want to look for diagrams sixes, sevens, and eights. This would be on the elevation certificate. The only thing you can use the enclosed space below the base flood elevation for is parking. Uh, building access or storage. You can't finish that space off and put a bonus room or a mother-in-law suite. That's illegal. Parking, access, or storage. That's it. Placement requirements of your flood vents. You need them on two different walls. You also have to make sure this is a townhome situation. These are privacy walls. We can't put flood vents in those walls, but we have this dividing wall here. We have to have flow-through openings, allow the water to pass through. If this is a fire-rated wall, be mindful that you're also going to want to use something that has a fire uh, damper kit um, with it. So there are fire damper kits out on the marketplace that are UL certified. So if I have to go through this wall with flow, flood relief, right, because I got water trapped in the garage and I can't get it out this back wall, we're going to put holes in this dividing wall, allow the water to pass through. But if that's fire rated, we're going to use a fire damper kit um, to allow for that to comply to the um, uh, the fire code side of things. Um, the other, so we know placement requirements, two different walls, and the bottom of all of our vents need to be within 12 inches of the highest adjacent grade directly below that opening. That's regardless of what type of material the foundation wall is built out of, or the wall in general, CMU, poured concrete, uh, framed walls. It the, the rule is still always two different walls and within 12 inches of the adjacent grade. Um, you can see in this, well, that you saw the Wagners. He had two vents on this side wall, three vents facing the river, um, both within 12 inches. That checked the box. This particular crawl space in the middle, vents on two different walls. This is a crawl space, so these are providing natural air ventilation. These louvers actually open and close with temperature, which is great, especially with 
where you guys are um, based out of. So in the winter, these louvers will automatically shut without human intervention or electricity. And uh, But God forbid you get a flood in the winter, the vents are still going to flip open. This air vents being circled is uh, because it's too high. And it also would need to be broken in the open position. Over here on the right, this is actually showing on the outside, the vents appear to be higher than 12 inches of the adjacent, uh, the outside grade, but they're within 12 inches of the inside grade, as you see in this diagram. So sometimes you are measuring from the interior. And we can help you with all the placement requirements and answer and field those questions on a project uh, specific basis. But um, just another example, oh, this is the no adverse impact, right? We talked about um, dry flood proofing or filling a site. When you fill or you dry flood proof, you have to be mindful, mindful and typically provide a hydrology study to the building department to show that you're not going to raise the flood depths. You're not going to expand the um, floodplain outward that could adversely affect neighboring property. So you see this in this diagram. You know, this was the floodplain before filling. They bring in fill uh, and then they build a slab on grade structure. Well, it increases the flood level. And then these homes that were out of the floodplain, now the water's being pushed their way. All right, so that's that's going to not just be associated with fill, but also with dry flood proofing. So something to to consider through. Um, just some examples as we wrap up wet flood proofing um, of commercial buildings. This is an NYPD bomb squad training center that we worked on. Um, the lower enclosed area was used for parking of vehicles and equipment, um, and they used a multi-frame ICC certified unit. So it houses, as you can see here, eight. 16 by 8 doors, so it provided 1,600 square feet of flood venting protection. Um, this is a Porsche dealership in, in Beaverton, Oregon. I tried to negotiate a really nice barter deal for a Porsche. It did not work. My blue Porsche is still sitting there, um, but we did a really nice project here. These are two by two um, multi frames. This is an it's a, pardon me, a dual function door where you can allow the flow water to flow in and out, plus the airflow when you need it through that crawl space. And what was pretty cool is it elevated these beautiful cars up on a pedestal. So eye level, kept them high and dry. They don't have to move any of their inventory prior to the flood. Um, they might still just in case Mother Nature doesn't listen to the uh, the elevation that they built to, but at least they're high and dry. Um, and it also accomplished the fact that now they put them up on a pedestal you know, pretty cool to see them at eye level type of thing. Uh, but each one of those vents covered 800 square feet. Um, here's the Medical University of South Carolina. This was a three by four unit, again, in a crawl space. And it provided, um, as you can see there, 2,400 square feet of protection. Um, dry flood proofing was not cost effective in this application, but elevating the building up and allowing that water to flow underneath uh, made the most sense. Now, before we dive in and finish up with dry flood proofing, um, when it comes to the codes, the regulations, everything that I'm, you know, going over here, ASE 2414, I can't stress enough, have this on your, your uh, shelf in your library. Uh, ASE 2414 is the latest and greatest edition. 05 was the uh, previous. Uh, 14, you're going to find the latest and greatest. IRC and the IBC references back to ASE 24. FEMA also references uh, back to ASE 24. So you'll uh, a couple other documents to be aware of, FEMA TV2. That's where you'll find all of the flood resistant material information. TB1 is where you find all of the flood vents and wet flood proofing. And then TB3, which we're gonna cover right now, is all the dry flood proofing. Again, I will shoot out an email afterwards with, um, with these particular documents so that you can save them electronically. Um, so dry flood proofing. Dry flood proofing is not an option when you're uh, uh, working with residential applications. But commercial, non-residential, you can either wet flood proof, put in flood vents, or you can dry flood proof. And we're going to talk about the various systems that we see in this picture. Systems that are passive, that pop up from underneath the ground in a trench that use the force of water. Uh, lightweight panels that can be customized to protect just about any style opening. Systems that are stored at the point of use. Flood proof glass where the glass itself is flood proof. And then perimeter systems is where we're gonna start. And, and perimeter systems are great for existing buildings that you're not making a substantial improvement to, but you need to get that flood protection element. This particular system here is like a true replacement for sandbags. And it rolls out, it's made of a PVC coated fabric, and it can be rolled out, and then wherever your seams are, you zip it together. It's uh, very lightweight and it's reusable where sandbags obviously aren't. 
one, two people can fully deploy this around a building in totally reasonable time, hours instead of days. All right. And I'm talking two people. Now, you'll see in this video anim animation as as I, I roll that the rolls come out. Right. So everything's on a roll. You know, we can do a 12 foot section. We can do a 33 foot section. But there is um, fiberglass reinforced battens within this. There's stainless steel cables to give it all strength. And as you see, you'll zip up the seam. You can uh, you can create a radius around a building like here. We're flooding. Right. So this would go around an existing building and it uses the force of flood water to seal the bottom portion of the system down to the uh, flat surface. All right. So whatever the flat work is that we're putting the system on, the weight of the water actually creates the seal in this. So it's, it's a great product for an existing building. New construction, you're not going to be able to use a perimeter system because you're going to have to harden the walls and then bolt a shield or a barrier right up against the building. But if it's an existing building that just got flooded, if it's a golf course that you need to protect, um, they can use this in emergency situations where they can create like a lily pad type of area for a helicopter to land. It's got a lot of good uses, easy to deploy and very quick and lightweight, right? So um, here's a picture of a property in Sea Isle, New Jersey, Mike Seafood, too expensive to raise the building. We couldn't harden the walls, but we did a, uh, this is called Deluvium. We did a Deluvium system around there that provides the needed protection. And it's the same technology they use on oil containment, uh, containment booms. So it's designed to be out in the weather for, you know, 25 plus years, where in our case, we're actually storing it until we need it for a flood. So that's a, that's a really great product. But now I want to talk and transition into dry flood proofing and the code requirements for new construction or substantial improvement. TB3, as you see here, will give you all the nuts and bolts of everything that you need to worry about. But essentially, what we're doing with dry flood proofing, we're making the builder water tight, impermeable to flood waters, right? So we harden the walls, and at any of our openings, we're going to provide shields and barriers. Now, there's some considerations when you're dry flood proofing, and this is all common sense stuff, but consider your warning time. You know, ASCE 24 requires a 12-hour warning time to be able to deploy any active dry flood proofing approaches. So do you have that warning time? Do you have the manpower to deploy the system? You're going to look at the velocities, debris impact. So events, we got to let the debris flow through. In dry flood proofing, you've got to take a debris impact to the wall and to the shield. Um, make sure you have your emergency plan and inspection and maintenance plan on file. That's going to contribute to your property owner receiving a dry flood proofing credit through the flood insurance program. Um, you already know what the standards are. We hit on ASE 2414 for all of our structural folks. Obviously, they're um, pulling ASE 7 as well. Um, but you'll find in the building code and ASE 24, the definition of dry flood proofing and, and for dry flood proofing non-residential buildings, it needs to be a sealed uh, set of documents that state that the building is dry flood proofed in coordinates to ASCE 24. All right, and those are the exact sections you see here, 6.2.1 through 6.2.3. That's where you'll find all the dry flood proofing info. But the main categories, the main things that you're working through, it's for non-residential, so you can't use it for residential. Um, uh, you're going to have shields over any of your openings, and you're going to have always have some sort of seepage through your system. So you're going to have to have a sub pump system. Now, some of the most popular methods utilized. And these are all products that our our particular company um, does uh, uh, represent and, and and works with designers on. Um, Probably one of the most uh, known systems are stop logs or flood logs. Now this is this is flood panel, and th these systems are they're stacked on top of each other, color coded for easily uh, deploying it. Um, and this there's a mid span post here, but these get bolted. There's tracks that bolt right to the facade of the building, and then you stack these logs. Now each log has a gasket in between it, so this is kind of the makeup of the components. But the the channel. Is, is roughly two inches by 10 inches, and there's different sizes, but that's a, that's a rough dimension. And it's hollow, and it's aluminum to make it light, but it's still got that strength. And that's kind of what it looks like from the, the front. And then each panel is gonna have a gasket um, fixed to the actual end of the panel itself. And then you have a wall mount. We can do an offset wall mount if there's something to, uh, that's obstructing the system. And then there's compression bolts to really compress down that gasket and form a seal. It's all about the seal when it comes to these systems. Now there's a wall plate that will fix to the outside of the opening that gives us a nice uh, seal point for our gasket 
um, uh, insert. It's a C channel, right? That then you slide the logs into and then you compress everything down. And then we do have those mid span posts depending on the distance that we're protecting. But a, a basic installation is you would, you'd have your fixed panels on the, um, or fixed plates on either side of the door. And then you would actually attach your, um, your, uh, your post here on either side of the door. And it, again, it's a, it's a channel for which the logs then are uh, slid into, and then you can press those gaskets down and in. Here's a couple of shots of the installation of the wall plate. Gives us a nice flush mounting surface for that um, C-channel bracket to come in and bolt to. And then here you can see the bolts that you'll tighten down to compress everything. Um, but used all across the country, you know, we can do long spans like you see here. We can go up to nine feet in height. And also this is uh, our installation crew doing it. So they install it. You wanna make sure you're using a system um, installed by professionals because that's one of the main reasons these systems fail. They weren't installed correctly. So kind of look for that turnkey aspect, plus then uh, the training of how to deploy them. Um, when we talk about time, you wanna make sure that you deploy these things in a timely manner. This was the Whitney Museum in New York, and it took them two days to deploy this system and 30 guys every time. And New York requires an annual flood drill. So they got to do this once a year and it costs them $50,000 each time. So keep that in mind, the cost to deploy. Do you have enough time? This is a system, a system used in New York City. They store it in New Jersey because there's no storage in New York, right? So things to consider when you're selecting. We talked about the 12 hour time. You know, you want to choose something that's going to be the most ideal dry flood proofing system is passive. All right. And you're going to want to have a periodic deployment of the system, just like you would have a fire drill. So just to finish up with some other examples, um, this is a, a panel that's uh, uh, constructed out of a super dense foam with a fiberglass skin. And then picture like rhino liner that you put in a bed of a pickup truck. It's sprayed with this uh, ballistic sealant that's used in the military to take it impact, to give it strength. And we can customize this to just about any size, and it's less than five pounds per square foot. Um, really good option. You can see a picture of a building here in Hoboken. We ran this distance right here with no post whatsoever, so there's minimum deflection with that. Um, it uses no back plate. We actually just have a neoprene gasket that goes right up against the wall, and that gasket conforms to the joints and so forth. And normally, you just see what you see here in this picture, you know, little caps within the fasteners. Um, and you could paint over those. So aesthetically, you wouldn't even know the flood protections there, right? But easily deployed in a matter of minutes. Wherever we have the need to um, connect, we would do like a spline joint like you see here, very strong. It acts like a post just about. And then we can even do corners and, and, and various radiuses with, uh, with this system. So that's called FRA panel. That's, that's a nice one. Here's a couple more installation shots, full door seal. Um, there's other options such as watertight doors. So you shut the door, there's a gasket around it, and the door itself is watertight. So you, there's, it's pretty much passive. As long as the door is shut, you're going to have your flood protection. You got to be a little careful with the gaskets not to get boogered up on a regular basis, but that's all part of your inspec inspection plan. Um, vault doors and so forth. Fourth here, swing gates, sliding gates. They're all options, all stuff that we can help identify and source for you. Um, but if you have a uh, utility room, you might be using some sort of vault door like this to give you that nice seal and flood protection. And then there's systems that provide egress in and out of the building that are stored at a point of use. This is a, a product from ILC Dover. It's called FlexWall. It's made out of uh, Kevlar and polyester webbing. So it's super strong, but super light. And it's stored in a box, great for critical facilities. This is actually the Con Edison power plant along the um, um, the river outside of Manhattan, right? The East River. And so the system's rolled up in this storage container and it deploys like a shower curtain. So you open the container, you unfold it, you cross it, cross it over your opening, and then there's a ceiling skirt, uses the weight of water, like that perimeter system, to seal it and prevent the water from coming in. This system can be deployed by one person in five minutes. You know, a couple other shots. This is a 20 foot wide system with no center post whatsoever. All right. So for the sake of time, I'll, I'll keep going. There's a cool video I'll send out later after the call that you can see a real deployment of a system 20 foot wide by nine foot tall. Um, we can also do this system in a trench. So instead of a cabinet on either side, it would live in a trench. You can see how easily it compresses here. 
passive systems. This is that system that comes up from underneath the ground. It uses the power of water. So water flows into an activation pipe and it forces the wall upward and prevents, now the water, um, this, the flow walls is uh, deployed, but it's using the force of water. Excellent for a vehicular entrance. Um, this too can go up to heights around seven, eight foot. And you can run this thing for miles if need be along a riverfront, but it uses the force of water to, to deploy the uh, system itself. So it's totally passive. Um, as I said, it's great for vehicular entrances like we see here. Um, you can get it in a steel cassette that you drop right into the ground and then pack it with concrete, or you can build a concrete trench. Um, the walls, as you can see, they come in sections like this and we will drop them right in. The force of water, if there's a car parked on it, it will lift that, that car right up off of the, uh, off of the wall. Um, it's been around, it actually comes from the Netherlands. We, we went over and, and brought this back um, to the United States and, and have, it's been really popular. I mean, it's a great system when you want it out of sight, out of mind, and know that it's going to work every time. And then lastly, passive, floodproof glass. The glass itself is actually floodproof. This glass here is attached to a uh, existing um, uh, bulkhead or seawall or flood protection wall. And we're dealing a lot with, especially with sea level rise and, and the fact that, you know, uh, the floodwaters are, are, are coming above our flood protection heights now with levees and so forth. Instead of obstructing view with views with more concrete, we can attach the flood proof glass and make like an extension on top of an existing bulkhead to give you protection against flood water. So that's an option along with flood proof glass. Uh, you can see in this debris impact video, um, it's been, des been designed to meet the hurricane rating, but then also flood proofing. We can actually do um, one continuous section. This is a 10 foot high uh, hunk of glass. It's oversized jumbo. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. We actually don't have any mullion supports um, that obstruct the view. So we can do um, a giant sheet of glass with no supports that's totally flood proof and no barrier, no shield needs to be deployed over it. So the glass itself provides the flood protection um, and very cost effective too when you, when you compare regular glass and then adding a shield or a barrier in front of it. So passive is always the best way to go, but when you're choosing a flood protection system, just don't consider that acquisition cost. Think of the storage. Where am I gonna store all this stuff? The maintenance, the inspection of uh, of the system. You know, am I going to have to inspect this every two weeks because I'm worried about gaskets getting uh, you know boogered up? Closure time. You know, co business continuity is crucial. You know, like in the Con Edison plant, they couldn't be shut down for days to deploy stop locks. Um, and then you got to worry about the training and annual deployments. Um, we can help with all this. Uh, good resources here, floodproofing.com, and then send the plans. The plans at floodproofing.com. Um, and, and one of our engineers will hop on it and provide some guidance and that's totally free. But with that being said, I think we, you know, just about at the time, but I'll field a couple questions. And if not, I'll, I'll definitely get back to you with any questions that were asked in an email for sure. Um, and I thank you for your time. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I'll go through the questions that have already been asked. And then if anyone does have any further questions, go ahead and type them in. But, um, since we are short on time, We'll just go ahead and have Tom answer those uh, later on. So um, the first person is asking, how can I get my credit as a CFM? So uh, CFM credit is self-auditing. So if you go to the ASFPM website um, and go to CFM, you will type in your uh, CFM number, your username, and it will prompt you. If you need a, cert uh, a certificate just to have on file for your own records, you can shoot me an email and we'll do a, cert, uh, a certificate for you. But uh, CFM self-auditing, so you can, uh, you can just input that in on your own. Okay, and the next one. What is the minimum amount of walls flood vents need to be installed in? The minimum amount of walls is two different walls. So no matter what, you have to have, and, and that's even if you have a 10 by 10 space, right? So 100 square foot and say one smart vent covers 200 square feet, you're still going to be required to put two vents in on two different walls. Okay, next. Can the by flow vents be put 12 inches up in garage doors? So you can install flood vents in garage doors. 
And just as long as the bottom of the vent is within 12 inches of the adjacent grade below that flood vent, then it would be in compliance. And our vents that we manufacture for garage doors actually are designed to be bolted right into the doors and have a cam system that allow the door to go up and down without um, you know, jostling the flood door open. So yeah, they can be installed in garage doors. And as long as the bottom of the vents within 12 inches, it would be in compliance. Okay, and then the last one for now, and for this question asker, let me know if this was a typo and if I'm um, asking this correctly, but why is no water table considered in the below grade wall pressure? Why is no water table considered in the below? Oh, well, you know what? That's a that's an excellent question. And I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. You know, from a flood situation, um, that's that certainly would, might be considered not from a wet flood proofing, obviously, but from a dry flood proofing, something that should be a design consideration. But to be honest with you, we really don't get too involved with uh, with the engineering side of a high water table. But certainly something with that uh, particular case should be part of your consideration. And, and maybe you don't even end up dry flood proofing in that particular case. Maybe you're using a wet flood proofing design. Um, so that's just kind of how I heard the question right now. But if you want to email that one to me too, that I could maybe provide some further guidance and hop off the phone and, and talk with you, that particular person one-on-one -on -one to help better answer that. Um, Cause I'm not sure if I fully understand myself, but. Okay, so that's all um, for the questions that have come through. Um, while I make these just final announcements, if anyone has a last minute question, go ahead and type that in really quick. And like I said, we can send that to um, to our presenter at the end. Um, so yeah, I just wanna thank you, Tom. This was a great presentation. I know this was really engaging for our members. And so I wanna thank you um, and everyone else who joined us today. And just another quick announcement, if you haven't, done so already make sure you click on the handouts in your uh, handout section of the toolbar and download those and um, take the quiz by next monday so that i can get an email out about pda certificates in the following week and then that's all i have so thanks again everyone thanks again tom and have a great weekend hey thanks everyone i appreciate your time thanks